We're back at Seeing Red, the New York Soccer Roundup. Mark Fishkin along with Dave Martinez. Preseason getting underway. The boys down in Florida getting ready to go. And we are very, very happy to be able to bring to you, for the first time on Seeing Red, New York Red Bulls general manager Jerome Debontin. Jerome has spent a lifetime in finance as well as in football. He has been a director of AS Monaco. He is on the board of the trustees of the United States Soccer Foundation. And on October 2nd, 2012, he was named general manager of the New York Red Bulls. Jerome, welcome to Seeing Red. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you so much for the time. Jerome, let's start here. You are a resident of the area and have been uh, around the New Jersey area for some time. Why do you think the Red Bulls have struggled in the past to really latch on and get attention in this crowded marketplace? It's so relative. You know, we probably averaged over 18,000 spectators a game last year, uh, which in comparison to the other team is above the average. Uh, As you know, we're not alone. We're in the league, and the league has a great impact on the growth of the sport. Uh, So often when we look at where we are, we have to compare ourselves to our peers. I would agree with those who would say that we should be selling out in a large metropolitan area. But I think that overall, we've done well. Uh, We're suffering from probably the same problems as some of the other teams, and it's not unique to New York. It has to do, I think, with the fact that there's probably a lack of continuity, not enough stability among our players, and if indeed players change every year or every 18 months, it's difficult at the end of the day for the fans and the people around us to really develop a tie to something that lacks maybe the right identity. Well, let's talk a bit bit about the identity of the team. Uh, Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's uh, some flux with the coaching situation. Um, The the team is now in preseason mode, and there isn't a coach in place. So with that and the turnover that we've experienced during uh, this winter transfer season, what what are the plans for the team? Do you have, A, a coach identified, and B, once that's settled, how do you go about getting all these brand new pieces in set and focused for the season, which is about a month away? It, it, it is a problem that we we faced in the past such a turnover. Uh, I was talking to Jordi Pair before he left, and you know he shared with me that he had found it difficult to play with 49 players. That was his number <laughs> during his tenure at the New York Red Bull. Yep. And I and I agree with you, uh, and I don't want to point fingers at anybody because I think that unfortunately the system, the, the way the MLS is organized, you know, does not help very much in terms of building that continuity. Now, granted, not every team had the same turnover as we did, um, but during those years, not everything was so bad either. Uh, I think if you look at the three years that Hans was in charge. If it's an objective look, you know, they did achieve you know, some milestone. You know, even this past year, they, they reached more points than any time in the past. Uh, so I think that even in this difficult environment, we can perform. Clearly, you know, it would be better. It would be wrong to deny that. It would be better for everybody if we had a coaching staff in place, because it's not just about one person, it's about having the right team in place. Uh, but at the same time, I would hope that the fans understand that we already have quite an incredible team in place. I mean, we have two of the greatest soccer minds, and I mean, Gérard Roulier and Andrew Roxburgh, working together uh, in trying to, in many ways, elevate you know, the standards and the quality of the team and with the hope that this will reflect itself in the performance of the team. We now have a sporting director in Andy uh, whose responsibility first and foremost is to put together this team. And I have faith that even though, you know, I understand that we're asking our fans to be maybe a little more patient than they had expected in the first place. (laughs) But I really have faith that in the end, the people that Andy will choose because really, the ultimate decision is his, 
you know, will meet the expectation of all of us, including the fans. There is still time. We're still, you know, many weeks away from the first game. Uh, and I think that it is better, you know, as I go through the process and leave it next to him, it's better to see somebody being so thorough that he is than, you know, having rushed into you know, whatever was available a month ago. So I think it's a very, you know, long, it's a very fair and due process. Uh, and as I said a few minutes ago, I really have faith that the right decision will be made in the end. Jerome, there are only 52 days left until the home opener against D.C. on March 16th. Can you talk a little bit about your plans to raise the visibility of the club in the media and with marketing and advertising before opening day? Oh, I can share some. I can't tell you too much because then I'll lose the benefit of the surprise when we come out. <laughs> what can you I share? Really, in regards to it, The you know, summer friendly games will be, uh, and the kind of additional benefit the season ticket holders will get for being season ticket holders. I think they'll all be excited. Um, we're fortunate that the numbers are up, in many ways substantially higher than last year at the same time. Uh, so I think there's already some understanding among our fans that things are changing for the best. We don't have a coach, I agree, we, we just discussed that, but at the same time, you look at the roster, you look at the roster movement that took place late November throughout December and even over the past few days, I think those were quite impressive and they do demonstrate that those decisions are not made you know, from one day to another, that there's a real strategy behind those decisions, that um, within the limitation of the league and the salary cap, now, we're really trying to put together something that we've not had before. Um, I, I will say that the marketing strategy you know, is in part the team. Uh, as you know, a winning team makes everything a lot easier for people in my position. Uh, but beyond the winning team, having a good story, having a group of players that the fan and the public at large can relate to, I think I agree important as a success on the field I think it's that's easy definitely... for me I think it's easier for me than it is for other people in the same position in the other team easier because we have an extraordinary stadium and right. I say that having traveled around the world um, having seen great stadium you know, having managed other stadium like the stadium in Monaco there's nothing like this Red Bull Arena and it's brand new so the, yeah. the, the challenge is you know, making sure that you know, the people who have not been there get a chance to come there. And you will see that you know, the number of very exciting things we're doing in regards to making the stadium you know, a bit more visible and, and getting more people interested in coming there. So there's right. plenty of room for optimism. I think that's really the trick, right? Because no matter how many players or no matter how many wins this team gets, when the club is not mentioned on television, aside from the game broadcasts, and it's not mentioned on any sort of sports radio, and it's really not covered terribly well in the market's uh, newspapers, um, the, the challenge is how do you make those folks aware and how do you convert someone that may be uh, more comfortable engaging with, with uh, soccer at 10 a.m. in a pub than actually mm -hmm. attending local. Do you have any thoughts about how to uh, energize those fans who are aware of the team and yet, for whatever reason, do not show much interest in coming or supporting the club? I think it's an issue that relates to our club. It's an issue that also relates to MLS. Uh, yeah, we, we've already implemented a number of things. I know from experience that there are dozens, if not hundreds of thousands of people who live in New York who played in high school, uh, who played in college, or who had brothers or sisters or children who played the game, who always liked the game, but who never felt that they were part of the big soccer family. Um, you know, I see that every year. I follow college soccer quite a bit, and I always feel for those seniors who 
play the last game of the senior year and for which sort of soccer ends. Right. Uh, and that's wrong. You know, I went through that myself when I graduated from college. I hated <laughs> that last game as a senior. But like it is for me, I stayed involved with the sport. But throughout the years, particularly working with the U.S. Soccer Foundation, I kept arguing, you know, every year there's a thousand male programs. There's 1,100 female programs. You know, with five to ten seniors graduating, we really need to reach out to those people and give them a sense that they, they belong in this soccer community. And so many of those people, and in New York or in the tri-state area, you know, I decided you know, upon becoming the GM of the club that I had to find a way to reach out to those people. And it's been quite successful. There is a real population out there of people who either watch you know, foreign games on TV or during the weekend, or who like the sport but never felt that, you know, we cared about them. And I'm trying very hard to communicate to most of them, or at least the one we can reach, that not only do we care, but we really want them to be part of our family. On, on a professional level, it's really interesting just taking your own experiences into account where, yes, you come out of college and there seems to be nothing left for the, for the soccer lover, for the soccer professional. But now with, mm-hmm. the, uh, with the new agreement with USL Pro, uh, the New York Red Bulls will have an outlet for many of their younger players, academy players, bench players to grow and develop. Talk a little bit about the USL Pro, the prospects of it, and uh, how Red Bull plans to exploit this very unique opportunity. In many ways, we've been exploiting it for years. I mean, we as a club, I think, invest more resources into our academy and youth development than any other club in this country. And that's really reflective of how our shareholder feels about the sport and about his passion for building success from the young ages up. Um, so what has come to the forefront this year is that other teams, too, wanted to have a chance to either keep an eye on the players who had gone through their you know, grassroots program than their academies as they were going into college or provide to those who didn't want to go to college or who didn't have an opportunity to go to college to play in a semi-pro environment. I think it's a very positive development. It's not enough. You know, the, the issue that we face is that we have a salary cap on our first team and it's, in the end, a pretty low cap, you know, considering what we're competing against. And with a cap so low, it's difficult for us to spend the right resources on those U19 program, uh, where we would like to, in many ways, do even more than what has been allowed this year. Jerome, you uh, the, the club has been working on a permanent training center seemingly for as long as they were working on trying to get Red Bull Arena built. I know that there's been some construction at the East Hanover site. Can you share with our listeners how that's coming along and the impact that that facility will have on the club? Uh, I like the way you said some construction. They've been of major <laughs> investment you know, in excess of $10 million in trying to build a facility that resemble, you know, what we have a right to expect for a team of that caliber. And it's almost over. I mean, the construction is almost over. Um, mm. We're hoping that as soon as uh, the field you know, produces the right grass, that we can, in fact, move all you know, the practices to the new place, Um, and right now the expectation is that by May uh, we should have the first team uh, practiced exclusively at this new facility. And I don't want to say it's state of the art, it's not as big as we would have liked, uh, but it's really a fantastic place and I would encourage the fan whenever we'll be open to, or we'll have open practices that they come and visit, um, because it probably one of the best, if not the best, that they will see among the MLS teams. Up until the point that you will be moving in there in May, uh, is the team going to continue to uh, honor their relationship with Montclair, or will practices be held at Red Bull Arena? No, at Montclair. No, in March and April, it would not be wise to hold the practices uh, at Red Bull Arena. You know, we, we need to preserve the pitch, and uh, we have an agreement with Montclair that we can use the facility as deep into the season as we may need. 
Now, last year there was some issues with the facility at Red Bull Arena. Uh, in particular, then coach Hans Baca was saying that it was probably one of the worst pitches in Major League Soccer due to a bunch of weather-related problems. Uh, from what I understand, there may have been some drainage issues at the stadium. Give us an update on the arena and uh, and the conditions of it now, especially after this very difficult winter that we've experienced. I never met a coach who was happy with the pitch. No. <laughs> <laughs> either the, you know, it's all either the pitch or the referee. And when it's, <laughs> it's one either of one of those two, it's the weather or it's something else. Uh, in some occasion, you know, it's warranted. You know, sometimes, you know, the, we suffer from you know, the kind of weather that we had in November. You know, overall, yeah, we we could have had a better pitch. Uh, we have one issue in the design of the stadium that has to do with the fact that we don't get enough sun. Um, the, the way the stadium or the arena you know, is oriented, we only get a few hours of sun on, on one portion of the field. But you know, there are some technical ways to, to deal with this. Uh, we are aware of the fact that we would like to have a better pitch. Uh, we've made some serious investment at the end of the season. In fact, right now there's no pitch at all in the arena. We took everything out. We because we are replacing the old field with a brand new. Field, no, still a grass field, <laughs> no <laughs> turf field. Uh, Thank you. And you know, I believe that the new coaching staff, when it uh, is announced and as it discovers the arena, will be very impressed. You know, people are not totally appreciative of the fact that you know, Gérard Roulier was the head coach in, in Aston Villa, um, mm-hmm. and that you know, people in the Premier League always regard. Aston Villa uh, as having the best soccer pitch in the league and probably best one in the nation. And clearly, you know, we have consulted with those people, you know, to address some of the shortcomings that we faced last year. Uh, so I think we go into this season feeling very good about you know, the quality of the pitch on which our players and the opposing team will be playing. I want to turn the attention a little bit, Jerome, to fan experience at the stadium. Uh, obviously, the PATH station continues to be a source of stress and frustration for quite a few of the fans that are coming from Manhattan. Are there plans, there have been plans for a while, but are you aware of any service improvements or physical improvements at the PATH station that will help New York City-bound fans coming and going? Practically, no. But I've met with the mayor of Harrison a number of times and his advisors. Um, obviously, the path was an issue ever since Sandy, so the, the many, yep. things, or many people we could not reach. Um, but we're fully aware of those shortcomings and limitations. Uh, we're definitely investing time in trying to improve those issues because we feel that you know, in many ways, the experience starts the moment the fan gets into the subway or the path or the, whatever mm-hmm. train he takes. Um, th- and I've shared a few ideas with my staff, you know, as to what we could do starting, you know, uh, on either side of the path line, you know, to make all those people feel like they're already somewhat in the arena before they get there. Jerome, just out of curiosity, there's been so much change with the team, uh, both on the pitch and in the front office. Uh, you have three major heads yourself, uh, Roxburgh, Julier. Uh, there must have been a lot of transition for you in this period of time. Uh, what were the things that have surprised you, and what have been the most difficult aspects of your job, especially as you're trying to get your feet planted with the team? You know, it's been fairly easy. For me, you know, I just moved from Chicago. Uh, mm-hmm. And I've been in Chicago for about 30 years, with the exception of the 18 months or so that I spent in Monaco. And as you rightly said in the introduction, I was involved, or I've been involved with the foundation for a long time. And I was part of an initial group that even funded uh, or lent money for the funding of the MLS. Um, so I felt very much at home when I, I took the job. and. In many ways, what I did find, or at least on the front office side, was a very well-structured team. Um, I did not meet my predecessors, and you know, I appreciate the, the fact that in the eyes of the shareholder, you know, there were things that had to be improved. But for the most part, I found a pretty unified team and some very capable people. And 
yes, there have been some turnover, at least from the outside, it appears like there was some turnover. But on the front office, I think things have been fairly stable, and I'm confident that we have a very good team in place. Uh, the challenge is, for me, you know, where you know, obviously throughout October, dealing with all the crisis that sort of came my way one after the other, mm-hmm. the worst one of all being undoubtedly you know, the, the murder of our coach. Yes, uh, Mike Jones. You know, on 14th Street in Manhattan, and I had been there for four days. And it sort of, unfortunately, set the tune of the, the whole month because you know, later on we had you know, a few issues that we did not develop at the time with a few players and, and with the coach, but it didn't disrupt you know, the performance of the team. And Sandy hit, you know, and, and Sandy was, was not easy. And obviously we were concerned with the stadium and we were concerned with the roof. Um, in fact, I moved into the arena for a whole week, you know, just to make sure that everything would be in order. Uh, and then after that, as you recall, there was this whole crisis with DC United. Uh, yes. The whole debate over should we go to DC first, should we play in Philadelphia? And it took some arguing and it took some a lot of energy out of me, you know, to get everyone to agree to and with the help of Kevin Penn in DC, I must recognize, to switch the game around. But that wasn't it. Uh, then we had the snowstorm. And, right. and the snowstorm didn't help because, I, in many ways, I argued with the league over you know, pushing the game back. And it was their decision not to push it back, despite my recommendation to do so. So by the time we lost that game, or oh, when we you know, lost the were pushed out of the playoff, you know, it felt like, you know, things were going to get even more intense because, you know, as you know, Hans Becker was told that his contract would not be renewed and a number of players were let go and the search for the new coach started. Um, so it's been extremely intense. And yet, not nothing that's unique except for, you know, this very unfortunate death earlier on in my tenure there. Um, as you run a professional club, and you'll hear that from many people in my position, you know that it's going to come at you from all angles. You just have to take the job knowing that, you know, from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m., sometimes later, phone is going to ring and a few crises are going to come your way. You just don't want to be surprised that it's coming your way. So, so you never thought about getting right back on that plane and going back to Chicago? No, 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 never. Uh, look, Red Bull is a fantastic uh, company. Uh, I have a great report with the people in Austria. They, they're fully committed to their investment in soccer in America. They want to win. Uh, that's what they have demonstrated in all their you know, corporate slash sports investment. Uh, and they've put together sort of a unique team. Now, we mentioned Gérard Roulier. Gérard is not here full-time, obviously. He, he is in Europe, and he's in charge of all five teams that Red Bull owns. Uh, but we know he's there when we need him, and in Andrew Roxburgh, obviously, we have an expert. And I'm very hopeful that you know, with Andy, Gérard, and the other people around me, that we'll have a very unique uh, team this year. And when I say team, I don't mean just the 11 players on the field or the one on the bench, but the whole entity, New York Red Bull, I think is gearing itself for, or preparing itself for a fantastic season. Now, as you look towards this fantastic season that you're hoping for, uh, your role is very much defined on the team. Um, you're in charge of the business aspect. I'm sure you have a say with the with the team as far as personnel goes, but Andy's got a bigger you know role to fill in that on that end. So, for yourself, what would your what would success mean to you this this year? How would you define success for yourself in the 2013 season and for the New York Red Bulls? Um, my, uh, I appreciate what you just said, uh, but it's one team. Uh, so my success is the team success. You know, it's important the team succeeds, and in many ways, I'm here to help Andy. I'm here to help the team, uh, and therefore, I would much rather see the team go very far, uh, and if why not win the the cup? Uh, even if we don't sell out every game, rather than selling out every game but not having a <laughs> performing team. Uh, 
I, I failed to mention when I said a few things about the team that uh, the press has not reported much uh, at this stage, uh, at least on Reninho. Uh, right. Uh, and, and I know that some people are going to say he's 38, but uh, you know, there are a lot of great players, and Ryan Giggs is the one that, who comes to my mind, who are 37, 38, 39, and who are performing and who are playing like they're in their 20s. In the case of Unino, you know, he played over 50 games last year in Brazil. Um, right. And it so happened that his last coach at Vasco da Gama was my coach in Monaco. And uh, I heard from his name is Ricardo. And Ricardo you know, shared with me that you know, he was really a great catch for us because he could play like a 20 year old. And like it may sound a little presumptuous to say that, if you look at his history of taking free kicks, he's far better than Beckham ever was right. at taking free kicks. So I think just him, you know, not that I want to put all the burden on his shoulder, uh, but having him, you know, should get all our fans excited. And I encourage those who don't know him to maybe go on the internet uh, and look for his past goals or compilation of his free kicks. But we may have that on our website in a few weeks, uh, showing you know, a compilation of five minutes of his best free kicks throughout his career. He'll be an exciting player to see on the field next to Tim and next to Thierry. Uh, so long-winded answer to your question, you know, my success is the team's success. Uh, I believe that you know, the, the team success is, is a necessity for us to do well on the commercial side. Uh, and yet I'm hopeful, you know, having said that, that with all the new idea and the strategy that we're going to you know, implement over the coming weeks, that we'll find ourselves with most of our games being sold out. It's looking good, as I told you. We went to where we were last year. Opening them is likely to be a sellout. And... Obviously, we'll be playing the, the Galaxy uh, a few months later, and that, too, is likely to be one. Uh, and beyond those two, as I look at the numbers and I compare them to the projection that we made, I have every, every reason to be happy and to be optimistic. Jerome de Montaigne is the general manager of the New York Rebels. Jerome, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to speak with you later in the season. You're very welcome, and don't hesitate to call. I'll be happy to come back. We'll have your emails and thoughts after this. It's seeing red on the.